We're going? Yeah. All right. I'm just sticking this in because COVID has kept us off the air for too long. And I know a lot of people have been waiting to see something from me and uh, some, something from us. There's no us today. Again, it's my wife and I only, but there was something that I realized that I hadn't gotten in front of you, which was, uh, you know, study chief Saito's lecture on a uh, letter from Sato, which I've already acknowledged, like one of my, my favorite go shows. And um, you'll see back, I don't know, several months, but you know, it's only a few rows of the videos, letter from Sato, and there's, all, there's four videos on it. Uh, it's a very important writing. Uh, this lecture itself, though, touches on something that's really important, and I, wanna, I, I have to read it, because it talks about why, if we're uh, doing the correct teaching, we, we encounter difficulties. You know, why, why do we have any sufferings? Why don't we just like ace it on everything and have a, a perfect, peaceful, no problem life, because we chant nam yoho rengeki. And this gives a really great definitive understanding of why that actually occurs. Okay, so I just want to share with you Vice uh, Study Chief uh, uh, Saito's uh, lecture. Again, letter from Sato. It starts uh, on page seven. It's the background. Nichiren Daishonin wrote this letter to all his followers on March 20th, 1272 at Sukahara on Sato Island. He was 51. On September 12th, 1271, Nichiren faced the governmental authorities' unlawful attempt to execute him on the beach at Tatsunokuchi. He survived and was exiled to Sato. On October 10th, he left for the island. After nearly three weeks of arduous travel, he arrived on Sato on October 28th. The next day, he took up residence in a dilapidated meditation hall. Tsukahara was a place where the locals discarded human corpses. Without adequate supplies of food and clothing, Nichiren braved the severe winter cold of the northern province. Furthermore, followers of the Pure Land School were trying to do away with him would be Nimbutsu people, right? Mm. Uh, under these harsh circumstances, Nichiren prepared to compose the opening of the eyes, completing the treatise around mid-February 1272, three months after his arrival on Sado. Regarding the opening of the eyes, Nichiren writes, the essential message of this work is that the destiny of Japan depends solely upon Nichiren. This is his declaration of his true identity. The actions of the votary of the Lotus Sutra of the writings of Nichiren Daishonin, page 772. In other words, he clarified that he was the true votary of the Lotus Sutra who underwent great persecution as the sutra uh, foretells. He was thus the only person who could save Japan, which was poisoned at the time by disbelief in and slander of the Lotus Sutra, the teaching of, of Buddhahood's universality. In the opening of the eyes, Nichiren encourages his disciples that those who continue fighting alongside him, despite great persecutions, will definitely attain Buddhahood. Those who continue fighting alongside him despite great persecutions will definitely attain Buddhahood. Now, how do we fight alongside Nichiren if he was a 13th century Japan? We're not. <laughs> it's by accomplishing with our lives the same objectives that he was trying to uh, and actually uh, uh, leaving as, as a legacy for us to follow uh, in terms of his life. He says, it goes on, around the time he completed the opening of the eyes, the nation was uh, plagued by internal strife in both Kamakura, the seat of the shogunate government, and Kyoto, where the imperial court was located. This fulfilled the prediction Nichiren made in on establishing the correct teaching for the peace of the land, land the, the Rishon Kokoran. He says, a Nichiren, um, uh, Nichiren's followers enduring governmental persecution in Kamakura, so even though he had been exiled, exiled to Sado, they were still being very heavy-handed with everybody that was continuing to try and chant nam myoho renge and continue in the practice he had taught them. It says, Nichiren's followers during government persecution in Kamakura could see a ray of hope in the turmoil. Uh, in the early spring of that March, Nichiren wrote a letter from Sato to encourage his followers in light of the prediction's fulfillment. In other words, he is a sage. He had already predicted that there would be this problem in the imperial court uh, between that and the shogunate, and uh, subsequently that actually occurred. That was what the, there were two remaining things that had to happen that before, you know, the, the world was uh, really a, a put at siege. He says, in the, finishes in the background. In the letter from Sato, bottom of page eight, Nichiren teaches his disciples 
about the meaning of his struggle and about the obstacles facing them. We might say that in this letter, he conveys to his followers the content of the opening of the eyes in a more understandable manner. Key points, bottom of page eight. At the beginning of this letter, Nietzsche and Daishonin explains that fear is caused by the yearning for life. Most fears then can be considered to derive from the fear of death. Or we might say fear is caused by one's attachment to self-preservation by the possibility of loss of status. The most dreadful, this is from the Gosho, the most dreadful things in the world are the pain of fire, the flashing of swords and the shadow of death. Even horses and cattle fear being killed. No wonder human beings are afraid of death. Even a leper clings to life, how much more so a healthy person. Even, continue with the lecture, even animals fear for their lives. Humans cannot help feeling strong fear and yearning for life because they have the capacity to be aware of their impending death. But if we merely cling to life in desperation, obsessed by fear and self-preservation, we cannot build authentic happiness. This is why Nietzsche shares the Buddhist teaching that even filling the entire major world system with the seven kinds of treasure does not match the does not match offering one's little finger to the Buddha and the Lotus Sutra. In other words, do not begrudge your life. This life is one of many countless lives. You will have another one. Promise. It's impossible you could have had this one without the phenomena that occurs that would have it create, be uh, redundant. Okay. He says he then touches, teaches to uh, that to devote ourselves to spreading Buddhism without begrudging our lives is the way to attain Buddhahood. So as long as we hold back for any purpose of self-preservation, comfort, lack of uh, opposition, uh, fear of what others might think, we can never attain Buddhahood. A, Buddhahood never ha a Buddha never has those fears. A Buddha always understands that they're in this world for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that's to propagate the teaching to those that they have a connection to, those that through dependent origination they will meet, and that they will propagate the law too. It says, since nothing, from the Gosho, since nothing is more precious than life itself, one who dedicates one's life to Buddhist practice is certain to attain Buddhahood. Now, what's, it, what's dedicating one's life to Buddhist practice? It's practicing exactly the way we do, embracing the Gohonzon, doing Gongyo, chanting Daimoku, but at the same time, always knowing that we must fulfill this responsibility to Kosen Rufu, which means teaching others. So, uh, Jigyo Keita is really what we got we got to have as a part of our practice to be able to make it all the way to the point of being able to re, uh, reveal our 10th world. Uh, and our 10th world absolutely exists in anybody, everybody, no matter how terrible they might be. No human being is without Buddhahood as a potentiality in their life. No one has limitations unless they accept them themselves. Each person, continues at the bottom of page nine, values his or her life more than anything else. But for what purpose do we use our lives? This is important. In society, many people out of fear of death and attachment to life and status lose sight of what constitutes genuine happiness. And many foolishly spend their lives on frivolous pursuits, <laughs> a lot of them, without ever experiencing true joy and fulfillment. And their lives come to an end from the Gosho. Human beings are equally vulnerable. They give their lives for shallow worldly matters, but rarely for the Buddha's precious teachings. Small wonder, they do not attain Buddhahood. Continue with the lecture, middle of page 10. After explaining that a selfless practice for the sake of Buddhism is the way to attain Buddhahood, Nichiren points out that the Buddhist practice for the latter day of the law is shakabuku, to refute people's attachment to erroneous teachings. This is in contrast to shoju, which is to lead people gradually to the correct teaching without refuting their misleading attachments. They just qualify. This is the time of shakabuku. We don't just uh, not tell the people the truth and so that they won't get fluffed up. If we have to, we're confrontational in clarifying to them what the truth is. Our, 
or else they'll continue to go on with delusion. So we try to separate them from that delusion by at least injecting into their life experience, which is a karmic reality for them, something that will carry on and on and on. That's how we open the door to Buddhahood to others. Okay, we do shakabuku, no matter what they say, we, tell, we, we teach them nam myoho renge -kyo. I used to always, the first thing I would do when I was going to shakabuku somebody, because when I started practicing, we did a lot of what we called street shakabuku, where we would just walk up to total strangers and say, have you ever heard of nam myoho renge -kyo? And as soon as somebody said, what is that? I'd say, well, first, can you say the words? And I would make them always say nam myoho renge -kyo before I would tell them what it was, because I didn't give a shit what they thought about what I said after that. I had already gotten them to open the door themselves for their own lives by invoking the word of the names, uh, the, the name and the words of the truth, nam myoho renge -kyo. So it continues here in the middle of page 10. Uh, why is shakabuku the method of propagating Buddhism by refuting people's disbelief of the correct teaching and their slander of the law, the way to attain Buddhahood in the latter day of the law? Why is this kind of methodology necessary and required? He continues, in the latter day, which is characterized by widespread slander of the law, there is no way to protect, there is no other way to protect the correct teaching of Buddhism. So if I perceive that I am a bodhisattva of the earth and an original disciple of the Daishonin, and that I've made my advent as a bodhisattva of the earth for the purpose of establishing his teaching for the peace and the pacification of the land, you know, exactly what he talked about in the Risho and Kokoran. I've got to understand that if I don't constantly speak out with the correct truth, if I let it slide so that somebody else's misinterpretation mm. is left standing unrefuted, I've contributed to the dilution of the correct teaching and the correct understanding that must be preserved by the Bodhisattvas of the earth. It's always my job. I don't want to be an asshole. Sometimes I have to be. Uh, he says, in the latter day, which is characterized by widespread slander of the law, and if they're not accepting what you're saying without knowing it, that's exactly what they're doing. There is no other way to protect the correct teaching of Buddhism. You've got to buy into that. That's the reality of the Daishonin's uh, 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 prognostication of all of this. That's what he said we had to grasp and do and why we had to do it. So take note of that. Goes, continues, furthermore, those attached to erroneous philosophies or to status and position, they're non-religious, but they only care about their power and influence. I could think of some people not far from here across a little bit of ocean that uh, would probably fall into that. Furthermore, those, who at those attached to erroneous philosophies or status and position, which means they don't have to be religious necessarily, will definitely react negatively and try to oppress those who practice shakabuku. If our commitment, our faith of the correct teaching of Buddhism is strong, then we can transcend our concerns for, our concerns for self-preservation and bring forth the courage to practice as Nichiren instructed. And that's what I'm trying to talk. This is all based on how Nichiren said we were supposed to behave in the fifth 500 year period and on into the 10,000 years of Mapo. He says, when we courageously promote shakabuku in the latter day of the law, the 10,000 years of Mapo and beyond, obstacles will definitely appear. So boom, obstacles will definitely appear. There's no, there's no way to get around this. As a matter of fact, they're supposed to appear because they're supposed to be there for us to overcome so we can show and prove and validate the power of what we're doing versus what anybody else might be doing. It's so important that we have difficulties. That's the only thing that keeps us clean. It's the only thing that keeps us focused to the gohanzan. The devilish functions will fill our heads with all kinds of bullshit in the absence of that, okay? We will forget the correct teaching and start making up thoughts that we just deem as correct, okay? We'll veer from the path of the correct teaching that's already been laid out by the original mentor, okay? So it says, when we courageously promote shakabuku in the latter day of the law, obstacles will definitely occur. That's why sages and worthies are tested by abuse. But if we maintain our commitment to the correct teaching, despite obstacles, no matter what happens, then through the strength of faith, 
courage and conviction, we can quash our own disbelief and eradicate our own slander of the law and get tremendous benefit from having made that cause. In this way, our innate Buddhahood, our innate Buddha nature will be activated and the life of Buddhahood will emerge, which is the greatest benefit we could actually, we don't have the wisdom to pray for that benefit, okay? <laughs> Most of the time. Nietzsche himself undertook this struggle, overcome, overcome, overcame many great persecutions, practiced the way to attain Buddhahood in the latter day of the law, and proved its validity through his own life. In this letter, he encourages us to go on uh, to go beyond our selfish concerns through commitment to the correct teaching and practice shakabuku. He then describes one strong, never retreating faith, courage, and conviction in the face of any obstacle or persecutions as the heart of a lion king. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to become indestructible as a re in regard to our faith. No persecution, no obstacle can defeat us or make us doubt what we're doing. And through that perseverance and strength of faith, we overcome every single one of those situations 100% of the time, no bullshit. All right, so going back to the Go Show, bottom of page 11, only by defeating a powerful enemy can one prove one's real strength. From the Go Show. When an evil ruler in consort with priests of, the, of erroneous teachings tries to destroy the correct teach, teaching and do away with a man of wisdom, those with the heart of a lion king are sure to attain Buddhahood. Like Nietzsche, for example, I say this not out of ignorance, and the certainty with which I'm probably speaking right now could probably uh, be viewed by some as some kind of arrogance, and it is not. It's a conviction in the teaching of Nietzsche, okay? And if he says it, it applies to me. The OTT reaffirms that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. There's no separation between me and Nietzsche and Daishonin. So I say this not out of arrogance, okay? But because I am deeply committed to the correct teaching as a bodhisattva of the earth, an arrogant person will always be overcome with fear when meeting a strong enemy. Buddhas never are afraid. They're a little bit cocky. They're very sure of the strength and the power of their own lives. They don't enter the battle thinking they're going to lose. <laughs> they enter the battle sure that they're going to win. This is the conviction of faith. This is the heart of a lion king. Okay, that's what that is. Through, my, through his own example, Nietzsche opened the path for all people of the latter day to attain Buddhahood. All I'm doing, as he writes... Those with the heart of a Lion King are sure to attain Buddhahood, like Nietzsche, for example. As proof of this, he refers to the revolt of, the Ho of Hojo uh, uh, Tokisuke, also known as the February Disturbance. Nietzsche's prediction of the calamity of revolt, revolt within one's own domain in on establishing the correct teaching for the peace of the land had come true. He emphasized this actual proof to indicate that he has attained Buddhahood and possessed and possesses the wisdom with which to save all people of Japan from the Gosho. Although I, Nichiren, am not a sage, I am equal to one. The prophecies I have made in this life have all come true. Therefore, you must never doubt what I have told you concerning future existences. Nietzsche points out that the uh, insanity of those trying to persecute him. He says that their essential state of life can be described by the passage, evil demons will take possession of others from the Lotus Sutra. Next, he starts to explain the central theme of the letter's latter half, how to change one's negative karma. Could I have a tissue, please? He addresses the question that many of his followers, followers harbored in their hearts. Why, when I am practicing the way of attaining Buddhahood, do I have to suffer persecution? And that's what many of us will feel at the point in time that we initially go through this process. But through the experience of many years of faith and continuing always to go back to the Gohonzon and never being let down as it relates to becoming victorious, you begin to understand that everything Nietzsche said about himself applies to us as well. He says, 
though his response through his response to this question of why then when I am practicing the way of attaining Buddhahood do I have to suffer persecution? That's the question. Nichiren is teaching us the meaning of suffering. Through studying his teaching, we can grasp the purpose of life's hardships and therefore the meaning of life itself. If something we considered a suffering before we had attained uh, supreme perfect wisdom, okay, turns out to be the reason we were able to, uh, to achieve supreme perfect wisdom, then it was no suffering at all. Trust me. This, this, okay. Page 13. SGI President Ikeda writes, the principles of changing karma is one of the teachings that underscores the humanism of Nichiren Buddhism. This cluster of blessings has come to me unsought. That was the quote I was trying to think of. President Ikeda writes, the, change, the principle of changing karma is one of the teachings that underscore the humanism of Nichiren Buddhism. That I shown and expounded this principle at the time of the Sado exile because so many sincere and dedicated followers were suddenly facing severe uh, uh, repression. Sharing their sufferings as his own, he explained why it was that they had to encounter such hardships as Buddhists. In this way, the Daishonin came to focus on karma, which is a source of suffering. Nichiren's teaching of karma, as explained in this letter, can be briefly summarized by saying that meeting obstacles or persecutions is the result of one's slander of the law in the, in the past. But through the blessings obtained by protecting the law, it's been through the protection of the law that I have obtained this diamond-like body, Shakyamuni says in the Nirvana Sutra, right? He says, but through the blessings obtained by protecting the law, same deal for us, that's how we get our diamond-like body, by reproaching the enemy of the Lotus Sutra, we can eradicate the grave offense of past slander and attain Buddhahood. That's the diamond-like body. Nietzsche also cites the example of Bodhisattva never disparaging who changed his negative karma and attained Buddhahood, later becoming Shakyamuni Buddha through over, overcoming great obstacles and spreading the Lotus Sutra. Since Nichiren is doing exactly the same, he says there is no doubt that he uh, will also attain Buddhahood. And he's saying that to us. We also will attain Buddhahood if you do all this. The way to change negative karma, he states, is also the way to attain Buddhahood. Wow, it's a two for one. He explains that those who persecuted Bodhisattva never disparaging suffered in hell, in the hell of incessant suffering for a thousand kalpas and reflected on their offenses. Worse, he points out, those pure, pure land school believers persecuting him without remorse will have to suffer in the hell of incessant suffering for an immeasurably long time. At the end, he expresses his pity for those who have given into doubt, renounced faith, and then started to, and even started to slander him. Nietzsche explains that those people will have to suffer in the hell of incessant suffering even longer than the Pure Land School believers who persecuted him. So if you know people who have stopped practicing and have kind of like given up on their faith, please don't let them commit slander in front of you. Stop them when they start to say things about the SGI or about their practice or about nam myoho renge -kyo. You do nothing by letting them continue to make the cause that will further them backwards. Okay, so when we protect the law, we uphold the teaching. We hear bullshit, we call it out as bullshit. Mm. We don't worry about whether somebody's going to get upset about the mm. fact that we said that's bullshit. You can say that in a nice, respectful way without just letting it pass. Mm. Okay, and by all means, don't let them continue with their slander in your presence or you're participating in it. All right, mm. encountering persecution on page 15 from the Go Show. The, perse the persecutions Nietzschean has faced are the result of karma formed in previous lifetimes. So even Nietzschean Daishonin attributes what he went through in this lifetime to causes he made himself and nothing other than that. The never disparaging chapter reads when his offenses had been wiped out, indicating that Bodhisattva never disparaging was vilified and beaten by countless slanders of the correct teaching because of his past karma. How much more true this is of Nichiren, who in this life was born poor and lowly to a Chandala, fa uh, Ch Chandala family. Uh, in other words, they killed things, they were fishermen. 
Uh, in my heart, I cherish some faith in the Lotus Sutra, but my body, while outwardly human, is fundamentally that of an animal. I was conceived of the two fluids, one white and one red, one of a father and mother who subsisted on fish and fowl. They, they, they killed things to survive, to eat. My spirit dwells in this body as the moon is reflected in muddy water or as gold is wrapped in a filthy bag. So what is he saying there? He says, it doesn't matter who you are, how you are, what you look like, what you're going through you're still gold on the inside of that filthy bag. No matter how might, you might want to feel weighed down by what's outside, never forget what's inside, and it doesn't matter. You can, you can, you can transcend that. Never be defeated by your station in life or things not going your way, because this is only a single moment of life you're experiencing. You don't know what the future holds if you'll just have the correct understanding of what this is all about. So he says, my spirit dwells in this body as the moon is reflected in muddy water or as gold is wrapped in a filthy bag. Since my heart believes in the Lotus Sutra, I do not fear even Brahma or Chakra, but my body is still that of an animal. With such disparity, be between my body and my mind. No wonder the foolish despise me. Without doubt, when compared to my body, my mind shines like the moon and, or like gold. Continuing from this chapter, Encountering Persecutions on page 15. If they have committed no moral offense in the present lifetime, it is past karma that causes sufferings, uh, uh, pardon me, that causes suffering of the Lotus Sutra's votary. Earlier in the letter, Nichiren Daishonin explains that votaries are those strongly committed to the correct teaching of Buddhism who fight with the heart of a lion king against the great persecutions caused by evil rulers and priests of erroneous teachings. He says that those votaries will surely attain Buddhahood. In other words, encountering persecution is the way to attain Buddhahood. Nichiren also describes the essential nature of his oppressors in light of the pa sutra passage, evil demons will take possession of others. Here he explains that meeting persecutions because of upholding the correct teaching of Buddhism is the battle against life's innate devilish functions. Innate devilish functions. From this passage onward, he discusses karma as the cause of experiencing persecutions. This is because the meaning of hardships, a hardship was and remains an acute concern for his followers. First, Nietzsche discusses the meaning of hardship in terms of people's tendency to avoid hardship. This is usually an unconditional human reaction. Secondly, dealing with hardship is inextricably linked to faith. Because of our aversion to hardship, we don't want any. Mm. When we practice, when we encounter it, we are likely to doubt the efficacy of Buddhist practice. I would, uh, pardon me, I began practicing Buddhism because I was told that I would become happy, we say. Why then do I have to experience hardship? Many of us have asked this question of ourselves and of the Gohonzon, okay? And there's a wisdom behind the answer to that the question. Nichiren addresses these issues through the teaching of karma as based on the Lotus Sutra, which differs from the view of karma otherwise propounded in Buddhism. The general concept of karma in Buddhism at the, page, at the bottom of page 16. The concept of karma locates the cause of present experiences in one's past experiences. Karma means our actions from past lifetimes, thoughts, words, and deeds, which bring about our present suffering and joy. Good actions, according to this concept, are those that elicit pleasant effects. Bad actions, accordingly, bring unpleasant effects. Karma then may be categorized into good and bad, and karmic results into pleasant and unpleasant. In general, however, when we speak of karma, we are referring to bad karma that brings suffering. Usually when we talk about, oh, it's my karma, this and that, we're really always, always talking about something that's inexplicably difficult, 
okay? We don't really deserve, but it must be from something we did at some point in the past. We very seldom think of reward, good fortune, as my karma as well. That also was created <laughs> by your causes, okay? So they're the same thing. They're the two different sides of a one coin. The, pit of, the pitfall of the common conception of karma is that it allows one to view karma as determinism. The idea that suffering or happiness in the present lifetime has already been determined, fixed, or fixed by one's past causes. We're screwed. We made this bad karma. There's nothing that can change it. This tends to, uh, to encourage a passive attitude. Well, if I can't change it, what can I do about it? I might as well... <laughs> not worry about it, which doesn't lead us on a path of action that makes a difference that changes that circumstance so that we, we, or we, we put a stop to that continuation of suffering. So he says, the pitfall of the common conception of karma is that it allows one to view karma as determinism. The idea that suffering or happiness in the present lifetime has already been determined or fixed by one's past causes. And Brother Bot, I am going to get to the three truths. But all of my friends at, at BSG, friends, you got you to gotta understand this point. Okay, Karma is not about fixed. This tends to encourage a passive attitude. Is if everything is predetermined and nothing is, that's the whole point. How could we possibly change anything? Nietzsche in Buddhism, however, teaches that people of their own free will can shape their future through their present mental, verbal, and physical actions. The Buddhist teachings, other than the Lotus Sutra, do not thoroughly emphasize the importance of one's present state of mind. This moment, this moment, this moment. The only thing that's real, the only thing that actually exists. This moment becomes the past instantaneously, and the future instantaneously becomes this moment. It's constantly in flux, okay? So nothing is determinative. We can make any cause it, you know, any moment that's more powerful than the effects that we, we might receive in this moment, all right? The Buddhist teaching, other than the Lotus Sutra, do not thoroughly emphasize the importance of one's present state of mind. It's our life state. Mm. That's why we're always encouraged, go chant Daimoku to the Gohonzon. As Buddhism developed, the successive schools generally deviated from the original emphasis of the teachings. This ultimately resulted in restrictions being placed on people's happiness based on erroneous concepts of karma. The whole caste system of ancient India is a reflection of that. Other Buddhist teachings do not clarify human beings' innate power to transform negative karma. Now, what does that say? What's transform negative karma? That means to change it into something else. It's no longer, if it's transformed to negative karma, it's no longer negative karma. I'll say it again. Other Buddhist teachings do not clarify human beings' innate power. So what is this declarative? We have as human beings a Buddha power in our life that can change negative karma as it exists in this moment into something that is not negative karma. It's transformed. Mm. The causality hasn't changed, but the circumstance of this moment has changed. It's been changed by us based on us tapping into the power of the simultaneity of cause and effect, which cannot be separated into cause and effect. Do you understand? Okay. So other Buddhist teachings do not clarify human beings' innate power to transform negative karma. The provisional pre-Lotus Sutra teachings, as it, said, it could be said, remain ambivalent about karma. Historically, this lack of clarity has often led Buddhism in the wrong direction. Corruption of the Buddhist clergy worsened the situation as priests actively exploited misconceptions of karma in order to control people. Examples abound of clergy subjugating people by emphasizing karma and proclaiming their own special power to clear up people's karmic debts and of using religious authority to intimidate others and to get coin for doing that little job for you that only really you can do yourself. Mm. The ancient Indian concept of karma originated with Brahmanism. Brahmin, Brahmin cler clergy claimed that by participating in various rituals, people could be reborn in the world of heavenly deities. A similar perspective developed in Buddhism as well. As will be elaborated upon later, Nietzsche refers to the common deterministic concept of karma as the general law of cause and effect, the one that everybody perceived prior to his advent. 
he then expounds on his on his concept of karma that is different from this. So Nietzsche's concept of karma is different from the traditional concept of karma. They're not the same concept of karma. This goes on to be clarified on page 18. The characteristics of Nietzschean Buddhist concept of karma in stark contrast to the earlier misunderstood perspective of karma and its capacity for authoritarianism, Nietzschean Buddhism puts forth a humanistic view which empowers people to fight and overcome their negative karma. As stated in the world of, the Daisho, of Nietzsche and Daishonin's writings, the following are characteristics of Nietzsche's understanding of karma. One, negative karma can definitely be changed. I'll say it again. Negative karma can definitely be changed. The teaching of karma should be expounded to clarify this point. Negative karma can definitely be changed. Two, the power to change negative karma is the emergence of Buddhahood through one's practice to protect the law, to protect the law. That's doing that shakabuku, that's doing, that's acquiring this diamond-like body, okay? That's exactly what that is. You can't not protect the law and change your karma. The fortune created by doing that is what allows you to do it. Which, Three, one must face karma rather than avoid it. You've got to face it. You can't run from it. You can't rename it. You can't blame it on someone else. And four, the Lotus Sutra teaches that all people have the capacity for Buddhahood, a state in which not only they can liberate themselves from their negative karma, but they can also help others do the same. In this passage, at the beginning of this chapter, Nietzsche incites the expression when his, when his offenses had been wiped out from the Lotus Sutra's Bodhisattva Never Disparaging chapter as the basis for his doctrine of changing negative karma. These words from the sutra indicate that Bodhisattva Never Disparaging eradicated his negative karma by reciting the 24-character Lotus Sutra and by bowing in respect to everyone he met, no matter how much they might revile or oppress him. The 24-character Lotus Sutra teaches that because of each person's innate potential for Buddhahood, want, no one should ever be disparaged. Bodhisattva Never Disparaging recited, I have profound reverence for you. I would never dare treat you with disparagement or arrogance. Why? Because you are all practicing the Bodhisattva way and are certain to attain Buddhahood. That's the 24-character Lotus Sutra. It's that simply, those words. I, would, I have profound reverence for you. I would never dare treat you with disparagement or arrogance. Why? Because you are all practicing the Bodhisattva way and are certain to attain Buddhahood, and therefore I would be disparaging a Buddha. That's what you're doing. You're in the, he, the 24 uh, character Lotus Sutra, never disparaging, is qualifying. You have an innate Buddha nature that you shall reveal, and you're on the path toward doing that. In Kumara Jiva's translation of the sutra, which is what Tentai and what everything we do is based on Kumara Jiva's translation of Lotus Sutra. In Kumara Jiva's translation of the sutra, this passage consists of 24 Chinese characters. The content of this passage can be described in, as the essence of the Lotus Sutra. As the essence of the Lotus Sutra. Bodhisattva never disparaging recited these words and continually practiced uh, uh, the bow of obeisance. Okay, as a result, he was persecuted, but he continued his practice despite the, uh, the oppression. By protecting the law, by protecting the law, he eradicated his past offenses. By protecting the law, he acquired a diamond-like body. While his teaching that we can change our offenses from past lifetimes is based on Bodhisattva never disparaging actions. Nietzsche also refers to the blessings obtained by protecting the law, a, a, a citation from the Parinirvana Sutra. The Nirvana Sutra, Parinirvana Sutra. Nietzsche in Buddhism encourages people to face their present hardship and overcome it by eradicating its karmic cause. Nietzsche fixes his gaze upon his present self and his karma from the past life from the past lifetimes. This passage clarifies the vital characteristics of his teaching, Nietzsche's teaching, the importance of directly facing our own negative karma 
rather than running away from it. First, Nietzsche takes an honest look at his present self, both body and mind. That's what he's talking about. I'm, you know, my body's no different from that of an animal. That's a contemplative process that he's verbalizing there. First, Nietzsche takes an honest look at his present self, both body and mind, and his standing in society. His present circumstance, he concludes, is simply his karmic retribution. But what he can truly rely on, he says, is the fact that my heart believes in the Lotus Sutra, suggesting that faith in the Lotus Sutra is the key to changing negative karma, his negative karma. What he's going through now won't stand. My faith will see me through it. And it ultimately did. We know that. Faith enables people to awaken to the fact that they are essentially at one with the mystic law. Don't forget, he was never supposed to leave Sato Island. Okay, he ended back up on Mount Minobu because he had overcome the challenge of death that he had been sentenced to the exile inside of the island over. So again, suggesting that faith in the Lotus Sutra is the way to changing negative karma, he changed the negative karma of, pre, of, of, of death. Faith enables people to awaken to the fact that they are essentially at one with the mystic law and to bring forth the unlimited power of Buddhahood. What does that mean? That means that you and Namya Horan Gekyo are inseparably the same thing. The law and the person are, I, they are one. They are not separate. There's not the law governing the person. All persons are the person. We're all bodhisattvas of the earth. We're all Buddhas, all right? Faith enables people to awaken to the fact that they are essentially at one with the mystic law and bring forth the unlimited power of Buddhahood. We change our karma in a single moment. For this reason, Nietzsche writes, since my heart believes the Lotus Sutra, I do not f even fear Bra Brahma or Chakra. In the worldview of ancient India, Brahma and Chakra are the most powerful gods controlling the reality of the world. Nietzsche remains unafraid of these powerful, uh, these powers because his heart, uh, pardon, because his heart that believes in the Lotus Sutra has become one with the mystic law and brings forth the life of Buddhahood, which there is no fear in Buddhahood. You would not be, why would you fear gods? You're above a god. Gods serve Buddhists, okay? But that's the, that's the point. Nichiren, however, is not unconditionally claiming the superiority of mind. He likens, likens his body to that of an animal and in comparison considers his, considers his mind to be more on par with gold or the moon. Even so, <coughs> pardon me, he explains the human mind is unreliable. It changes moment to moment to moment. The human mind, when drunk with delusion, succumbs to its own devilish functions, delusion, doubt, fear. The path to changing one's negative karma lies in overcoming such weaknesses of the mind. That's from resolute faith. All right, I've made it all the way up to page 21. What are we doing on time? 42 minutes. Huh? 43 minutes. Now. Good, I'm going to continue. This is testing worthies and sages. Uh, on page 21. One who knows what slant, pardon me, who knows what slander I may have committed in the past, and none of us know what we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. I may possess the soul of the monk superior intent or the spirit of Mahadeva, uh, perhaps I am descended of, from those who contemptuously persecuted never, a bodhisattva never disparaging, or I'm among those who forgot the seeds of enlightenment sown in their lives. I may even be related to the 5,000 arrogant people or belong to the third group who failed to take faith in the Lotus Sutra in the days of the great Buddha, universal wisdom, excellence. It is impossible to fathom one's karma. So the Daishana clarifies, you can go crazy trying to figure out by looking at this moment what cause you must have made for this to happen now in this moment, it's all bullshit. It's all just mental masturbation. It doesn't matter. It is impossible to fathom one's karma. Give, in, you're, give yourself into the Daishonin's wisdom. He says, though, even though you can't fathom the karma, the truth of the reality is that in this moment, iron, when heated in flames and pounded, becomes a fine sword. Worthies and sages are tested by abuse. Mm. This is not a sign of a bad person, okay? <laughs> this is the sign of a liberator, a teacher. My present exile is not because of any secular crime. Mm. It is solely so that I may expiate in this lifetime my grave offenses and be freed in the next from the three evil paths. I'm cleaning my act up and showing everybody how it's done for their sake. 
not just mine. In Nietzsche and Buddhism, protecting and above all believing in the law is the key to changing one's negative karma. At the root of all this, of the unfa at the root of all the unfathomable karma accumulated from past lifetimes, lies slander of the law, the fundamental evil, the basis of all actual negative karma. Only through Buddha wisdom or faith can we overcome this fundamental evil, which is why when discussing the effects of causes made in the past, Nietzsche and Daishonin focuses on the grave offense of slandering the law, the root, like I just said, the cause, the root of negative karma. There is no other way to overcome past slander of and disbelief in the law than by strengthening today one's belief in and commitment to protect the law. What gives rise to such slander is one's lack of understanding of the mystic law. This, Buddhism teaches, is the fundamental darkness that exists within human life and is the source of all evil. Ignorance. Also, not knowing the truth. Also, that's why we do shaka buku. Also, existing within human life, as Buddhism explains, is our fundamental enlightenment or Buddha nature. So they're both inextricably there. The, the original state includes both fundamental Buddhahood and fundamental darkness. Our existing, also existing within human life, as Buddhism explains, is our fundamental enlightenment. Previously, we were talking about fundamental darkness. We also have fundamental enlightenment or Buddha nature. That's what that is. That, when we call it forth, can break through fundamental darkness. To manifest this fundamental enlightened nature is to become one with the mystic law, to fill ourselves with life force, wisdom, and compassion. That means the ability to go in front of the Bohonza no matter what you're experiencing and to realize why you're experiencing it and draw forth the power from your life to create the benefit that for the first however period of time it was coming from something outside of you, ultimately you realize that's you. You call it forth from you. You don't pray to have it come from somewhere else. You pray to the Gohonza to bring it forth from your life so that you can show others the correct understanding of what its source is and how to bring it forth. All right? To reiterate, life is endowed with both fun the fundamental darkness, the source of evil, and the fundamental nature of enlightenment, the source of goodness. In, in, in entity of the law, the fam fabulous Gosho, one of the 10 major writings, explaining that life is endowed with both delusion and enlightenment. Nietzsche writes, when one becomes aware of this, it is clear that one should discard the ignorance associated with evil and delusion and take as one's basis the awakening that is characterized by goodness and enlightenment. Duh! It, to take as one's basis of awakening that, to Take as one's basis the awakening that is characterized by goodness and enlightenment means in concrete terms living based on faith in the Lotus Sutra in which the Buddha expounds the universality of Buddhahood. Strong faith endows us, ordinary people enveloped in fundamental darkness with the wonderful power to bring forth our Buddhahood from within. Not to have someone else bestow it, nothing from a priest, nothing from a Soka Gakkai leader. This has to do with you and your fundamental state of life. Put more concretely, to rouse our faith or conviction in the power of the Gohonzon, into which Nietzsche infused his life of Buddhahood, is to take as one's basis the awakening, the awakening that is characterized by goodness and enlightenment. There is no greater good or better cause we can make than to chant to the Gohonzon with faith in the teaching of Nietzsche and to perceive the fact that there's no separation between us and the fundamental aspect of that Gohonzon that we're chanting to. And that that fundamental aspect is not coming from the piece of paper, it's coming as a reflection of the fundamental aspect of our own lives. Our Buddha nature is what makes the Buddhahood of the Gohonzon manifest and dwell, connect us. To arouse faith in the Gohonzon's power is to have conviction in both our own potential for Buddhahood as well as that of others. We can't just believe that the great good leaders, all of the President Ikeda, oh, he could attain Buddha. I'm just a piece of shit. No, you got it all wrong if you think that way. If it's good for him, it's good for you. You're equal. Daisaku Ikeda is not a better, uh, uh, he's not a different human being than any of us. Okay, neither am I, neither are you. 
All right. To rouse faith in the Gohonzon's power is to have conviction in both our own potential, our power for Buddhahood, as well as that of others. It's to believe it's universal and to understand it and, and, and the truth that it is. It means, too, that we possess the wisdom, the wisdom to realize that our own and others' lives are connected as entities of the mystic law. And when we lack wisdom, what do we substitute for it? Faith. So this is saying it means, too, that we trust the Daishonin's teaching, that we possess and, uh, the, and uh, that are of, and other people's lives are connected as entities of the mystic law. We're all entities of mystic law. We're all Buddhists. It means developing compassion with which to nurture others in their pursuit of enlightenment. By writing, it is impossible to fathom one's karma. Nietzsche suggests the likelihood of having slandered the law in his past existence, the action that is the source of evil. He then writes... Iron, when heated in flames and pounded, becomes a fine sword. Worthies and sages are tested by abuse. The persecution Nietzsche and experienced enabled him. The persecution Nietzsche and experienced enabled him to call forth and eliminate the negative influence of his grave past offenses. This is analogous to iron that has yet not yet been forged and therefore contains various impurities such as air bubbles. Iron in this state cannot be used to manufacture a sword. It must be heated and tempered in order to eliminate its impurities. In the same manner, our actions to protect the law and spread the correct teaching of Buddhism will make our negative karma, especially that which has been caused by the dire offense of slandering the law, to come to the surface to be eradicated meaning persecutions because we are spreading the correct teaching of buddhism actually forges our lives so that we can get rid of our negative karma and be buddhas in our present form nitrin writes that the true worth of sages and worthies will be proven when they are vilified in other words whether one is truly a believer in the lotus sutra a genuine fighter for kosaru for kosarufu is revealed by the fact that he or she meets with persecution. Nietzsche then concludes, my present exile is not because of any secular crime. It is solely so that I may ex expiate in this lifetime my grave offenses and be freed from in the next from the three evil paths. That means that to attain Buddhahood in my present form. The reason he met hardship for which he is blameless is so that he could transform his unfathomable negative karma and reveal his innate Buddhahood in this lifetime. Nietzsche talks about being freed in the next lifetime from the three evil paths. Slander of the law is the source of evil. As long as the influence of our past slander remains, we encounter one evil after another. We can do nothing to eradicate ourselves from the three evil paths of hell, hunger, and animality. The only way, the only way to transform this chain of negative causation into one of positive causation is to supplant the influence of our past slander in this lifetime by protecting the law and bringing forth our innate Buddhahood. That means to attain Buddhahood in our present form, thereby creating goodness for our lives in one circumstance to the next for all future lifetimes. This transformation this transformation caught from a common mortal to a thus come one is called changing negative karma because the truth has now something that will permeate in our existence lifetime after lifetime. No matter how we start out, we will encounter the correct teaching. We will embrace it correctly. We will manifest it in our lives. We will be living examples. We will teach and lead others, period. Hardship takes on a new meaning when we view it as an opportunity to forge our lives. Hardship takes on a new meaning when we can view it as a way to become undefeatable badasses. Okay? In this regard, President Decatur writes, Iron, Iron, or President Decatur writes, Iron, when heated in flames and pounded, becomes a fine sword. This is the main theme of the principle of changing karma in Nietzsche and Buddhism. Iron, when forged, becomes a sword. In the same way, the purpose of faith and of religion is to make it possible for us to forge our lives, which again is getting rid of the impurities. The forge is getting rid of impurities. It's not just suffering. It's utilizing things that manifest 
and our experience somewhat as suffering as the means to achieve our Buddhahood and make it emerge. We don't focus on our karma merely so that we may repay our karmic debt and bring our balance to zero so that we can suffer no more. Rather, it is to convert, to convert our negative balance into a larger positive balance. This is the principle of changing karma in Nietzsche and Buddhism. And it is the Buddha nature existing in the lives of all people that makes this possible. Our focus on changing karma is backed by our steadfast belief in our own Buddha nature, and great hardships provide us with the opportunity to forge and temper our lives. When things are most painful, that is the time when we can most deep, deepen, uh, pardon me, that is the time when we can deepen most our humanity. In summoning up, in summing up his attitude towards being exiled to Sada, the greatest persecution he had countered that I shown and declares in the opening of the eyes, this I will state, let the gods forsake me, let all persecutions assail me, still I will give my life for the sake of the law. He asserts that though everything might be taken away from him and though he and though even the heavens might abandon him, he will continue advancing serenely along the path of his convictions. Nothing can harm someone who stands up resolutely in this fashion. Faith enables us to build a life of such fortitude. From this perspective, great difficulties represent unparalleled opportunities to expiate our past offenses. And in the process, they afford us a chance to establish the immense state of the life of Buddhahood. The purpose of religion must be to help people develop Nietzsche and, pardon me, the purpose of religion must be to help people develop. Nietzsche and Buddhism accomplishes this by allowing us to view hardship as an opportunity to forge our lives. Accordingly, it is up to us to deeply realize that by fortifying our lives through hardship, we can manifest this, the supremely noble state of Buddhahood. To have conviction in this possibility is to believe in the Lotus Sutra. And I'm going to continue because this is the last part. Slander of the law. Pardon me. No, this is two. There are two more parts. Where am I now? 57 minutes. Okay. Um, because I'm going to come back and do Brother Bot, and this is all going to take like hours to get downloaded. I'm going to go ahead and stop here on page 27 where it begins slander of the law. How to transform, my subtitle here was how to transform offenses of slander in this lifetime. Okay, so we'll start there again tomorrow and I will finish this tomorrow and we should be out of COVID lockdowns shortly. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.